So I think the best way to kick off this episode is a to go running. We should have, you know, we, I think we both went running this morning. I logged nine miles. You logged a little over 10. Yeah. In a torrential downpour rain <laughs> in central Texas. It was beautiful. But I got a DM yesterday when I announced that you were coming on the podcast. And they said, this episode will be the war of the worlds in terms of short length. <laughs> yeah. Because Courtney wears shorts to run in that are probably longer than my pants. <laughs> and I wear shorts that are as short as can be. And I thought that was like the, the best description to how to kick off this episode. <laughs> yeah. And neither short is right. Like people should just wear what they're comfortable in. Personal preference. Personal preference. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, having dinner with you last night and, and learning more about your training and, and things that I knew just from things you share online and in articles, you are, and it seems like you're a person that just follows the path that's natural to you. You don't try to force things. And I think that's, it's so relatable and it's so cool to see like this, you know, you're the elite of the elite ultra runners and here you are just paving your own path, doing your thing. And it's, it's awesome to see. Well, I mean, we can talk about ultra running a ton, but I think one of the cool parts is that there is no like formula, like marathon training. Um, we were talking about how you had scripted paces and workouts and everything and people have dialed in how you do a sub three hour marathon but in a hundred miles like it, the path to get to a finish line can look a lot of ways and I think that's one of the things that intrigues me about ultras is that we don't know a lot and so we all get to just kind of figure out that puzzle by ourselves well you're really just trying to prepare for what is the unknown sometimes right yeah exactly and that's what I loved about training for my first ultra was there's like, there was a structure to my training and there is right now for this next ultra, but at the same time, it's, it's pretty loosely structured in terms of just go out and run. Yeah. Just go log some miles and marathon prep was so to the T like paces that you almost lose the love of running a little bit in it. And for me, ultra prep has been refining the love of running and what it does for me both physically and mentally yeah because it's adventuring with your feet yeah and trying not to mess up too bad <laughs> oh I've, I've fallen many many times yeah me too there's very rarely a run where I don't come back bloody <laughs> so I would love to know you know what influenced you to sign up for your first ever ultra I was it was after college and I had done a few road marathons um, and I signed up for those just because I was curious on if I could run 26.2 miles. I thought that sounded insane. And um, I w actually was texting goodbye to people before the start of the road marathons because I thought my legs would shatter and that would be it. I would just be this heap on the side of the road. Um, and when I finished 26.2 miles, it triggered a thing for me where I just wondered what else I could do that sounded too hard. And stumbled into this ultra running world, which I had no idea existed, signed up for a 50K and thought the same thing. I was like, 31 miles is impossible. There's no way I can run 31 miles. And then I, I did and I loved it. And so then it like snowballed into, well, what's the next thing that sounds too hard? And that's kind of what keeps me coming back to ultras is, is wondering what's possible and like, when we doubt ourselves, what we could actually do if we just tried. I have this saying that I firmly believe in, and it's that doubt is only dangerous when you start doubting yourself. Because, I mean, I think most of us can say it, your, our entire lives, people doubt the things that we say we're going to do. And if you truly believe you're going to do it, chances are you're going to do it. Yeah. But when you start believing that doubt yourself, that's when it's, you start pulling back the reins a little bit. Yeah. And- I mean, that doubt can grow a lot, especially during an ultra. So like fighting that doubt is part of 100 miles or 200 miles or, you know, whatever distance you're trying to go after. And there's so much time in your mind to start doubting yourself. Oh, so much time. That, that's the crazy <laughs> part is like to put it into perspective for, for people who haven't done ultras, it might be days 
like literally days where you're fighting the doubt that you can do this thing. Yeah. So before going into your first ultra, did you kind of always live your life by the standards of going after the next hardest thing, going after the next biggest thing, whether that be like personal development, professional fitness, because what I've seen like with a lot of ultra runners or a lot of endurance athletes I find are also business owners, entrepreneurs, because those skill sets kind of just, they work together. Yeah. Were you like that before doing ultras or did that refine your, your mindset? I think it was a little of both for sure. I was raised in a family where if you did something, you did it all in. So you don't halfway do something. If you sign up for a sport, if you're doing a school project, you know, if you're going to have this friendship, you go all in on it and give it everything you have. And so that was like instilled in us really early on. And, um, carried forward through all of the things in my life. But ultra running, I think also was a teacher for me of that. Like you got to go all in and chase your dreams. If, if you want to do these things. Cause you, you were, you were ultra running when you were still working full time as a teacher, correct? Yeah. Yeah. What did that look like? And I know we talked about this a little bit last night, but I'd love to share those, those details of what training looked like while working as a full-time teacher, because a lot of the times people think that these professional athletes were just born professional athletes, right? you're born, you're like, someone knights you, the ability to be like this (laughs) professional athlete and say, this is your job. But there's always, in most cases for a lot of people, this transition where you're, you're doing both in order to fulfill your passion. What did that look like as a full-time teacher training to prepare for that transition to full-time professional athlete? I have always loved running, period. So um, already during college, after college, I would always get in my morning run because it just makes me feel like a better person for the whole day, clears my mind, gets my blood moving. I feel like I can take on the day then. So that was already part of my routine. Um, And then I started uh, signing up for these ultras and that happened pretty quickly where I was interested and in wanting to sign up for more. Um, and then it was doing that same morning run weekend runs. I was starting to try to go a little bit longer, but for the first few years, it wasn't anything extra crazy on top of just what I was already doing. When I started really getting into ultras and wondering like, what could I do if I invested some time into training for it? Then I was wanting more miles than the normal running hours would allow. Um, so then I was piecemealing it together throughout the day before school. I would get in a run during lunch. I would maybe sneak out for a 20 or 30 minute run. And then after school, I would get in whatever miles I still wanted, but I think that was partly because I love running and I wanted to do more of it and I wanted to do higher mileage. And also I've never had a coach in ultra running. So I was just kind of experimenting with myself. Like if I get in all of these miles in a week, will my races start going a little more smoothly and will my finishes be a little sooner (laughs) than they were? Is that what you found that as you started adding more mileage on a weekly basis, that's when your running improved? For me, it helped. It also helped a lot to get on trails. Uh, I was running a ton on just the city streets of Denver um, and focusing then on running trail races. And I would fall all the time on the trails because I just wasn't like, I hadn't figured out yet how to run on trails. And it takes some time. Like you have to pick up your feet more, you know, you can't be just scuffling along and mindlessly, you know, wandering along the trails, you're going to eat it every time then. So once I started actually training more on trails and getting in more miles, it was helpful. But that's also one of the things like more miles doesn't automatically mean better results. I think all of us are really different. So weekly mileage is very personal for different bodies, I think. Like yeah. how many miles do you do a week? Like right now, my weekly mileage is between 60 and 70. And if I'm not training for something, it's lower than that. 
we'll probably get up to, we'll get to a hundred mile weeks yeah. at, at the peak of it. For me, that's, that's a lot of mileage. Yeah. Like I, I feel hundred mile weeks for sure. Um, and like right now, most of my training isn't necessarily based off of mileage. It's time. Yeah. It's running for time. But I did find that like trail running is, it's, it's completely different running from road running. Road running for me, it's effortless. I can go out, my mind just disappears and my feet are just moving on their own. When I transitioned to trails, which are the trails you ran yesterday around yeah. Lake Georgetown, yeah. I got I got so angry because <laughs> I remember I, it was like a 17 mile run I did this one day and I'm trying to prep for Leadville 100. I was like, all right, I gotta find some technical trails. First like 10 miles felt good. But then as I started to fatigue a little bit, my legs weren't lifting as high. I was tripping every half mile. I was getting so angry at myself for falling. Yeah. But those, those trails will eat you up too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, those rocks were like really jagged. <laughs> well, that's when, I, that's when I ended up switching to a more durable shoe. Because being a heavier guy, I was like, I'm going to fall right through this shoe into, yeah. this, into this rock. <laughs> but for me, trail running was also fun because your mind also kind of disappears, but it goes to focusing on where your feet are falling. And I'm not someone that has much experience running trails. So when I was in Leadville, I was watching people who had experience running trails and they're just running across it. Like it's, they're like walking on water. Yeah. And I was just moving slow across these boulders and rocks and stuff. But I can see it's one of those things that it's like a, a mind muscle connection memory. Yeah. It takes practice for sure. But even then, like I still fall. So that's just part of it. If you're trying to like move quickly and learn how to move quicker on a downhill, you're going to eat it sometimes. Do for you, sure. Do you have all your toenails currently? Uh, currently I have all of my toenails. Yeah. <laughs> do you, do you lose, your, do you lose your toenails a lot? I used to, I, in the past few years, I, it's not really a thing for me anymore. Maybe I'll get to that point. Yeah. Almost all my toenails are just missing right now. Or you got to figure out your like sock shoe glide combo for your feet. Do you put anything on your feet? No. I think, do you use the Injinji socks? I do. I started using those after Leadville because my my toes were so busted up that they were rubbing when I was running. So I found those Injinji socks, the toe socks. You love them? I love them. So then you should put on some sort of uh, anti-chafe on your feet. So each toe has its like glide in the little toe garage of the toe sock. Mm. <laughs> so I do squirrels nut but- butter all over my feet. I like squirrels nut butter. Yeah. And then in gingy socks and my shoe fit and uh, no toenails get lost usually and no blisters. I, I don't get blisters anymore. I mean, my feet have kind of become durable to that. Yeah. <laughs> but right now we're... Two months post Leadville, a little over two months, and I just pulled off my my big toenail. Oh man! Two nights ago, I was saving it though. <laughs> oh, I was saving it for the intro of a YouTube video, and uh, I took it off. My wife gets so mad. I took it off, and I put it in some vice grips. And I took it down to her and showed her, <laughs> and she hated it. Yeah, she hated it. <laughs> well, you can make it into a necklace for her or something. Oh my! I think <laughs> I'd be sleeping outside. I'd be sleeping outside with the dogs. So when you, so when you transition to to full time professional runner, what did that moment look like? Like it was you and your husband Kevin sitting down saying, "This is the moment we're going to completely shift," or was it this thing that you were thinking about for weeks and months or even years? Like what did that moment look like when you said, "I'm going all in." Yeah, I'd for sure been pondering it for a while. And just being a teacher, your schedule is uh, based on the school year calendar. So you couldn't just like stop in an instant and change paths. So I'd been pondering it and talking with my husband a lot about like, you know, I'm trying to fit in all these miles. And then there's trying to be a great teacher and a great wife and a great, you know, daughter and friend and all of these things. And it's feeling like, um, a lot right now. So what if I just went all in on something like pick a path and see what happens. And, um, we discussed how like when we're 90 years old, sitting in rocking chairs, looking back on our life, 
what would be something that we would be bummed we hadn't tried. And uh, one of those things was trying ultra running full time. So like, just see what happens if we stop teaching and go for it. Um, and I'm lucky to have a situation where I could do that because I had no income from running at that time. We were just like, what if the day was wide open to run and train and get better at it? What would happen? And would I even like it? Like it could have gone where having it as your job makes it so you don't like it anymore, you know? So that was definitely on the table. And, um, I think it came down to just like, why not? Like try this out, see what happens. And if I failed miserably at it or hated it, or, um, it just wasn't working for us, like as a lifestyle, then I would pivot back and find a job again. But it seemed like a, a thing we had to try to feel like satisfied at a, in our future 90 year old selves when we looked back. Well, it's almost like the saying, and I felt this before in my life, if you try to be good at everything, you're not going to be great at anything. So it's like when you're spreading yourself too thin across the board, you're trying to be this, this teacher, this runner, wife, daughter, like all these things, you spread yourself thin. You can't really dedicate it to, yeah. to that one thing. So how did running then, like how did your, your performance transition when you went full-time runner? Well, I found out I loved training all day. Like that was sweet. I was all in on the schedule. I wasn't bored. Um, and I was able to sign up for then, you know, races that involved travel or races that were 240 miles long that maybe wouldn't have been as possible with a like, teacher scheduled job. Um, so that was really cool. And, and, uh, yeah, we've, we've loved it ever since it's been awesome. When you go for your runs now, does it feel like work or do you still have that same feeling when you first started? It, no, it doesn't feel like work. And I'm actively trying to not make it feel that way because I don't want to ruin running for me. I love it. Like I hope to be doing it my entire life. Um, and I, I uh, love how it makes me feel and just the freedom out running. So um, I'm definitely hoping to never run into that wall where I like resent it or um, get stressed about it because it's become a job for me. What is it like for you? I think everyone has something that they love. People that run, they love it for different reasons. What is it that you personally get out of it? I think I love the time in my head and the thinking or just turning the radio off entirely. I love both of those things about it. I think that's what I love too is especially now where there's so many distractions in life. It, like my mind is busy. Yeah. And for me, my morning run, because I, I love running when it's dark or transitioning to the morning. It's my favorite time to run. Yes. There's so many distractions in life that my morning run is at one time where they all disappear. Yep. My phone doesn't exist. The news doesn't exist. And I don't go into runs trying to think of something, like actively thinking. I kind of just let things come to my mind. Yeah. And I've talked about this a lot of times before, but if I ever have any problem in my life, it finds me in a run. And if it keeps coming back into my mind, I know I need to address it because it's affecting some part of my life. Yeah. And for me, running is... It started as something physical, but now it's completely like the most mentally freeing thing. And I think about this sometimes because like the reality of it is you're just going out and like moving your body. Right. You're just like, it's like you're walking, but you're going a little bit faster and you're picking up your feet a little bit more. And to explain that to someone that's not a runner, it's, it's really difficult. Yeah. And initially, if you're trying to get into running, it doesn't feel that way. You're like really focused on your breathing, really focused on the steps, you know, like you have to think about the action a lot more. But as you do it more, your body just remembers how and then your mind gets to wander. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think the runner's high was a real thing for the longest time. I have said runner's high is bullshit. It doesn't exist. Because <laughs> when I was in the army, like running is one of those things that we had to do. We didn't choose to do it. We just knew we had to do it. Right. 
So it was a, if you, if I was told we have to run eight miles for the day, it's we're running this eight miles as fast as possible to get it done with. Right. And then we're going to the gym and, and throwing weight around. And um, when I transitioned out of the military then and I started running for fun again, it sucked. I'm not going to say it was fun, but it took a long time. I mean, almost years to finally find this high where it was, I forgot I was running. I forgot what I was doing. I came to, and it was like four miles later. I said, that's the high. Yeah. That's it. And it doesn't happen every time. Like I'll still have runs where I'm like every quarter mile feels like 10 miles, you know, like they're just the ones that drag on. Those still happen for me. Um, but then a lot of them are where they just feel effortless and the miles fly. So 2012 was your first 100-mile race. What was, your, what was your longest race before that? Was it a 50-miler? Yeah, I'd done a 50K, a 50-mile, and then I signed up for that first 100. How'd the 50-miler go? It was cool. It was, that's, I think, what really got me hooked on ultra running. It was in the Colorado mountains, these beautiful trails in Steamboat Springs. And uh, it was awful, horrendous weather the entire time. So we were just getting pelted by rain and hail and wind. And everything pointed to we should be miserable. But all the people around me were just having a blast out there. And that was when it clicked for me of like, this is a community I want to be in, and this is what I want to do with my free time now is run these. Well, that's what I found about the ultra community is, you know, I've, I've experienced the triathlon community, Ironman races, the bodybuilding community, powerlifting, CrossFit. I've tried it all. And the ultra community is one of those communities I've found that is the most inviting. Like, I... My favorite part of my first ultra was we'd be a mile away from the checkpoints. You could hear people screaming. Yes. And then you roll in and they don't care who you are or what place you're in. Everyone's chanting for you like you're in first place. Yeah. And I was like, this is, these are my people. Yeah. This is who I want to be surrounded with. Yeah. It's really special. And then afterwards, same thing, like at a finish line, no one cares what time you had, you know, what your mile pace was. They just want to hear your stories from your day out there. Like results don't matter. It's a community of like, we went through some stuff out there and we both did it. So now let's crack a beer and talk about it. Cause it's so fun. Yeah. I love, I love stories. Yeah. I'll sit and I'll sit and listen <laughs> to people's stories all day. And I tell stories just as much as I listen to them. But what happened to that first hundred miler that changed because you DNF'd at mile 60? Yeah. Which is just 10 more miles than the 50 miler. Yeah. So what happened over the course of that race? I um, let that seed of doubt just grow really big in my brain. So I started a lot of negative self-talk when my legs started hurting, which it's normal for your legs to hurt when you've run that far. Like no matter where you are in the field, it hurts to run that far. So when my legs started hurting, I didn't know that that was like what everyone was experiencing. I thought, you know, oh no, my legs are already hurting. I'm only at mile 40 of this hundred mile race. What a joke that I'm out here. Like who did I think I was to sign up for a hundred and think I could finish it? And that negative self-talk and that seed of doubt just grew where finally I convinced myself to throw in the towel and give up at mile 60 because I thought I wasn't cut out for a hundred miles. So you didn't really have like, you didn't have expectations. Of, you didn't know what to expect going into it. No, I just wanted to finish. Um, but for sure, I, I wanted to like try my best at it. And uh, I was, I mean, probably my pacing was off, probably nutrition was off, but the thing that ended my race was just self-talk and how I became so negative and convinced myself to stop. Do you remember what your nutrition strategy was for that first race? I think I was just like popping jelly beans in every once in a while. <laughs> I love it. I didn't know anything about ultra running. Like I had done those few road marathons where people just take cups, you know, Gatorade cups off of a table every couple miles. 
I didn't grow up where you ate during athletics. Like I didn't really understand that it didn't make you tougher to not drink water and to not eat. It actually made it like really silly. So it was a whole learning curve for me about nutrition. And that was a factor in dropping probably. But the thing I can point to the most is just my head. Like everyone's legs feel like that at 60 miles, but my brain was like too negative and I didn't understand the mental side of running yet to like click on being tough in my mind to overtake the pain in my legs. I think that's a good takeaway where I always say hard is relative for people, right? What's hard for you might not be hard for me in some cases, but what's hard for me might not be hard for you. Like what's hard for you might be a thousand miles. <laughs> what's hard for me might or be. Or lifting any of the weights you lift. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like what's, yeah. what's hard is relative to each other. And if you're hard, like what's, what's difficult, your difficult meter is low going into something different. Well, that's, that's very difficult. And I think one way you raise that difficult meter is by doing harder things yeah. and, and challenging yourself. And that's why one, I love running, but also another reason where I think ultras are so great, whether you're going to compete or just finish it, because you're challenging yourself with something where you know you're like, you're not going to run a hundred miles and not feel it. Yeah. At, at one point you're going to feel a hundred miles and it's going to challenge you and it's going to hurt. And that's one way to kind of raise that meter to, okay, what's now I, now I can hold with, withstand this threshold. What's the next threshold? Yeah. Yeah. So mine, yours is a meter and mine I think of as the pain cave and like chiseling it out to be bigger. So every race I can go in there and make my capacity for that suffering or for pushing through things a little bit bigger by making this pain cave larger in my head. Do you enter the pain cave now at a later point or is it you can be in the pain cave deeper? It, I mean, it's all just an image that I've concocted for myself, but well, I, I have this image in my head right now too, where I'm, I'm like picturing this cave. Yeah. yeah. So I enter at the same point, but I'm trying to make it as big as possible. So like tunneling in different directions, maybe depending on the challenge or the type of race it is, or just making areas like wider and bigger so that there's more room to go in there the next time when I encounter it again. What's the deepest you've been in that pain cave? <laughs> Pretty deep. <laughs> I want to hear it. I want details. I don't know because uh, like when you go back there, I don't know, like I know that I'm in it and I know that I'm chiseling and that my whole purpose of doing these ultras is to find that pain cave and make it bigger. So like I know that it's happening, but oftentimes it's such a world of hurt that like everything else is kind of a blur. Like it's just laser focused on moving forward and like burrowing in as far back in my brain as I can to keep my legs going. That's epic. <laughs> I think it's one of those things that more people need to experience. That's what I found, you know, up until... Leadville 100, I'd say the hardest thing I've gone through was ranger school, but that, that wasn't over 30 hours. I was there for four and a half months, but it was this, this like food and sleep deprivation and just keeping, you had to keep putting one foot in front of the other, just walk on the trail, walk on the trail. And Leadville had that same type of experience and I want to say energy or lack thereof, mm. where it was, you're tired you're hungry and it's just putting one foot in front of the other and everything else kind of just mute sound. Yeah. It's almost like you have headphones on and everything else is just. And like blinders. Yeah. You have blinders on and it's muted, but it's such a powerful place to be. Cause that's when you like, you really work on yourself. Yeah. And that's what I get from it. Yeah. And that's the part I didn't understand when I dropped out of that first hundred. I didn't know that when your legs feel like they're failing you, you can switch to your mind. And like, I didn't understand the connection and how powerful our brains can be in overcoming 
that physical hurt where you feel like you couldn't take another step. If your mind just makes you and stays positive and doesn't let the doubt creep in or grow, then your body will follow. When did that click though? Like what was the moment where you realized that the mind had to kick in when the body gives up? I think so after that race, I mean, almost 36 after I had already signed up for my next hundred because I watched all of these finishers of this hundred mile race I had dropped out of and none of them looked physically fresh. You know, I don't know what I was thinking in my head I would look like, but they looked like they went a hundred miles and I was like, but they did it. Like, why did I give up so fast at me finishing a hundred miles? So I had signed up for my next one. And in the next hundred mile race, I think it really clicked for me because there was going to be no quitting at that one. And when that's your mindset, you have to stay strong in your brain. Even though my body was failing me, I, in that next hundred mile race, I cried for the last 10 miles of it because it hurt so bad, but I just knew I wasn't going to let myself feel that, uh, quitting feeling again. And so then I was finding like, oh, my brain is actually the thing, the locomotive right now. Like that's what's propelling me forward, even though my legs hurt so bad. What was the recovery like after that, that first ultra? Was it worse than you expected or was it? The one, one I finished? The one you finished. Oh, I mean, I, I couldn't walk straight for weeks, I don't think. I was awful. My legs were all swollen. My feet were swollen. Everything was painful. Um, but I knew right away, like that it was a thing I wanted to try again. You want to feel that again? Yeah. <laughs> does, does your, does your central nervous system get taxed after these races or is that pretty adapted at this point? Um, I still sleep poorly the couple nights after and like sometimes my appetite is a little off as well. See, that's one thing I didn't expect. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that afterwards. I thought I was going to sleep like a baby that night. Yeah. And I thought I was going to eat everything in sight. And I couldn't sleep for like three nights. I had no appetite. And I think that that was, for me doing Leadville, that was the most tax my body's been where it took like a solid two to three weeks to kind of feel normal again. Yeah. I, was, I was running seven days after, but it was more than muscular pain. It was deep. Yeah. It's like a deep, uh, a deep hurt. But at what point, which day after did you decide you would like to do another hundred? 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> 24 hours after I was like, I think, I think it was part of it was reaching those low points and realizing how much work you can done on yourself during those times. You just have this greater perspective one was the community of the ultra space, just the way people came together, yeah. supported one another. Another part was seeing the BPN team like really bond over that experience. And I just, I follow my gut a lot of times, all the times I follow my gut. And sometimes I'll do something. I say, my gut just tells me that's not the space. Like don't go there again. There's no return. But after the ultra, after Leadville, my gut was like, you need to, you need to stay in this space yeah. a little bit more. Something just feels, something feels right. The people are good. The energy's good. Yeah. The races hurt. Yeah. It's cool because it's a personal challenge, but it's also a team sport in like the craziest way. You're a team member with your crew. They're all helping you get to the finish line, but also everyone in the race feels like, like, it's not like you know, you're trying to throw elbows at each other. It's like you pass someone and they're struggling, you try and give them some good energy. And same goes if they pass you later. There's just like people helping everyone around them be better and try and get to this finish line just because. So what's that look like from the professional level? Do you go in these races, do the, do the elites go in competitive where it's you're trying to fight against someone? Or are you trying to push each other to see how far each other can go? I think, I mean, people probably have different mindsets depending on what makes them tick. But for me, like I want the people around me to be great and have really great days so that maybe 
you know, I can be a part of that and get the most out of myself. Um, so the people that I'm usually around in races are the same where like if someone's bent over the side throwing up, like you're going to stop and check on them and see if you can help them at all to keep going. Because at the end of it, we all just want to get to the finish line and ride the roller coaster of a hundred miles. And someone else's lows might be when you're feeling really good. So I always feel like if you encounter each other during that, like you should give some good energy then to maybe pull them out of that low. And then when they pass you, when you're in your low and they're riding a high, maybe you get some energy back from them. I mean, the, the highs and lows are, I think it's very proportionate to the mountains you're probably running in. Like, you know, the highs are coming, you know, the lows are coming and she's just balanced, you know, across the board Yeah. throughout the race. Yeah. Is a hundred miles the minimum distance you'll do now? <laughs> no, what? no, but anything shorter, I worry about my hamstrings tearing. <laughs> really? No, <laughs> it's like a fifty mile sprint. Yeah. <laughs> no, I like fifty mile races, and I like all the distances. I like to um, just challenge myself to try things. So for sure, like short and fast and really technical would not be my strong suits, but I want to try them because that's exactly what I'm here for is to test myself. How often do you experience gastrointestinal distress? Like how often do you throw up on these, on these races? Is it, is it every one or is it occasionally? Not every single one. Um, but for sure, as the races get longer, the odds of it happening get higher. I believe it. <laughs> I got lucky. I didn't, I didn't really experience much of it, Yeah. but I saw people curled over throwing up all across yeah all across the race I mean you were at high altitude for 100 miles like it's surprising actually that you didn't have any problems I don't honestly I don't know how I didn't speaking of you live in Leadville <laughs> that's yeah. that's awesome yeah I wish I'd been there to see your finish it was uh our whole team ran across the finish line together that's cool and I was watching when I watched the documentary back See, I don't get like too emotional very often. I cried at our wedding uh, and I cried at the Leadville dock. Oh, well, and that uh, toffee date dessert. I, I will cry over. <laughs> if you guys are ever in the Austin, Texas area, let me tell you. <laughs> there's this restaurant called Peacock. It's Mediterranean food. Do you like Mediterranean food? I love Mediterranean. Oh, I love Mediterranean food. <laughs> and it was this toffee date dessert I was telling Courtney about with this ice cream on top. I dream about this. Next next ultra I run, when I cross the finish line, I'm gonna, Steph's going to say, what can I get you? <laughs> Toffee date dessert, please. <laughs> That's all I want. Speaking of diet, <laughs> I think this would be a, a great transition into, I think this is what makes you one of the most relatable professional athletes that I've ever met, is that, I mean, I... I Sometimes when I'm around like professional athletes, interviews or for BPN stuff, it's like, I will only eat these foods. I will only stick to this training program. I need things this way and that way. And it seems like from the shorts you run in to the foods and the beers you drink, you just follow what you enjoy and what works for you. So like, let's talk about like diet and training. What does your diet look like on a regular basis, not during a race, when it's not mash, not mashed potatoes, quesadillas, and candy? <laughs> like what, what do you typically eat during the day to fuel your training? I eat whatever sounds good. So I don't follow any specific diet. I, don't, I definitely don't eliminate any food groups. Um, I enjoy food, and I think for me, like part of running is – enjoying it. And so I don't want just because I'm running to impact the other parts of joy in my life. So I don't know. It's, I don't People ask what I eat in a day. I'm like, I don't, I'm not sure. Goldfish crackers. <laughs> like, there's no plan. I eat a lot of snacks. I um, will also like really tune into any cravings because I feel like our bodies can tell us what they're missing. 
if we just listen. So there's some phases where I'll eat just like tons of red meat because it's all I'm craving is like ground beef on everything. And then other times where it's like lots of greens and salads and um, yeah, nachos or anything in between ice cream. Would you say you're pretty in tune with your body at this point? I'm trying to be, and I'm trying to really trust that I am and trust my body to tell me what's going on. So same with like mileage, because I don't have a coach, you know, I'm, I might like use myself as an experiment and try out a different sort of week or a lot more miles than normal or different sorts of miles. And then I try to tune in, like, what did that do? Like, what's the domino effect happening here? Because I tried that thing. When you like, say you're just running for a normal week, how many miles do you think you're logging? I and, think, and you're not prepping for something. Yeah, I'm averaging like 115. So what's a what's a day look like? like? I think last night you said you go out and you run anywhere from two to six hours a day. Well, so my morning run will be my longer one usually. And yeah, I guess, I mean, if I'm running a normal week, that one might be anywhere from two to six hours. And then I might in the afternoon join my husband for his 45 to an hour run just to hang out with him. And is that every day or how many days a week are you running? Uh, I'll run most days. Yeah. I don't have a prescribed day that I take off every week. Some weeks I won't take any days off um, and I'll string together a couple weeks like that. Or some days I'll take a couple days off because I'm just feeling a little more run down than normal. That's what I found with the kind of my programming over the last couple of years Transitioning into the endurance space, I hired coaches and I still work with coaches because I didn't really know what I was doing or getting into. And what I've learned over time, with, even with strength training, like for strength training, I auto regulate my workouts. I don't really know what I'm training that day until I get to the gym. And I start warming up. And I'm like, you know, today legs feel pretty good. I'm going to do legs or back feels good. I'm going to do back. That's unusual for weightlifting, right? It is. Like yeah. Normally people are just like leg day. Yeah, usually there's a strict structure. Yeah. And I'll try to hit body parts a certain number of times each week, but I don't know exactly when I'm going to hit it. Okay. Just based off how I feel. And what I'm finding with running too is sometimes for me, my best weeks of running are when I just go run based off feel. So if I start running, I'm like, mm, today's, today's not the day. I'm just going to run for like an hour. But then there's some days like last Saturday where – I was running for three hours and it felt like I was running for 45 minutes. Yeah. You're just cruising. Yeah. And those are my, and that's when it's really fun. Yeah. And then you're like listening to your body. So it's telling you, you know, push the gas pedal all the way down today or today's not the day for that. Like mind, mind yourself. So when you go into a prep, then, you know, you decide to do a race. Does anything change or you just, you just hold that? I'll keep the same basic structure for it, but then um, I will like find out a little bit about the course that I'll be running and say it's uh, like the Hard Rock 100 is goes over a 14,000 foot mountain and has tons of climbing in it, or there's fast, flatter races. So I'll pay attention to what kind of terrain I'm headed for and um, try to include that a little bit more, but the same basic structure is still there and it's still definitely just listening to my body and uh, what the day will hold. Sometimes when I leave the house, I don't even know, like, if I'm saying see you in two hours to my husband or, like, see you before the sun goes down. Like, <laughs> oh, my, my wife says, what time are you going to be back? And if I'm not back by that time, she's in her car. Look, she thinks really? that, She's like, you got hit by a car. I know it. Well, that's good. She's looking for you. I mean, it's. It's not ideal how I leave my husband hanging like that because then he has no idea, you know, when to start looking. You carry a tracker <laughs> on you, a Garmin, like a Garmin tracker. If anything? I'm going to do a big mountain day, I'll for sure have some sort of tracker. Have you ever had to be rescued on a run? No, I have sent a message that was like, please bring me a burger because I'm starving. <laughs> I love that. Of all the races you've done so far. What would you say is your favorite? What was the most enjoyable, most memorable, most fun? I think it's impossible to choose, but 
if I had to, uh, I think the Moab 240 was really, really fun. And it also like blew my mind that our feet can bring us 240 miles. Like that was a really cool door to open for me of like what's possible and made me intrigued by those really long distances. I would love to hear more about that race because you got first place at that race. And I think you beat the second place finisher by more than 10 hours. I can't wait for you to do that race. I want to do that race. Yeah, you're going to love it. It's so cool because you're out in the desert for part of it through these canyons. Like it feels like, I mean, nothing really is out there. There's not even insects or birds that choose to be out in some of these places. It's so like remote and hot. And then other parts of the course, you're in really high snowy mountains. So you get all of it. You also can see parts of the course from other parts. So you'll be standing like over in these canyons over in this part, but you're looking way over and you see the silhouette of these mountains and that's where you're headed. And it's like the craziest perspective to see that you're going there with just your footsteps. What's that, what's that course look like? Is it multiple loops? Is one it, big loop. It's one big 240 mile loop. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Candace Burt, it was, she's the race director. And I think that was part of the idea is to make these non-repetitive 200 mile races wherever she can find a cool course for it. So she has that one. She has the Tahoe 200, which goes around Lake Tahoe. Amazing. Also recommend that. Um, and she has one called the Bigfoot 200, which is up in the like Pacific Northwest area. Have you done Bigfoot? I haven't. No. Do you want to? Absolutely. Yeah. I really like the idea of, I want to do a, a race over 200 miles. So I felt a hundred. And I mean, for my first hundred, that one, I felt that. Yeah. That hurt. Yeah. But I want to know what 200 feels like. So if someone at the Leadville 100 finish line had turned you around to go again, would your legs have gone with? I think my, my mind, my legs wouldn't want to go with, but I think yeah. my mind could take me yeah. another hundred for sure. Like that, for, for, that fourth hope pass would have been <laughs> so hard. I think a, I think a shed of a tear would have dropped down my yeah. my eye at that like, point. Why is it so steep? <laughs> well, I remember I went into Leadville with because uh, sometimes when I announced I'm doing these these things, and when I announced I was going for a sub three hour marathon, when I announced I was doing Leadville, there's a lot of doubt. There's there's you will never do this. You're not going to do this. For me, when I got to the starting line on Bloodville, I was like, I'm finishing this race, whether it kills me or not. And I think you get out there and for me, I built up Bloodville over so many years because I kept putting my name in the lottery and was finally selected. And I was out there and I was like, I'm running the Leadville 100 right now. I was at the top of Hope Pass and it was just, it was beautiful. Yeah. And it was, it was a site you could only get to about walking up to yeah you can't drive to get the the checkpoint there they use llamas right right so it was one of those things where i realized i was i was doing this thing that not many people get the opportunity to do so it was how do i find how do i find more of these yeah how do i, how do I push it to that next step yeah 200 200 plus <laughs> yeah moab just sounds sounds epic what's the climbing like at Moab? Um, there's for sure climbing. It's all kind of in the back half. So the first half is pretty runnable desert stuff, but still kind of rollers. And then the second half is where you're in the LaSalle mountain range. And that's when it's like real mountain terrain. Uh, but I don't remember, maybe in 200 miles, it was like 30,000 feet of climbing. Okay. I'm not sure. And you operate pretty well off of little sleep, right? <laughs> well, it's one of the puzzle pieces of wanting to do these really long ones that I'm intrigued by is like, how do you master the sleep game so that you can get the most out of your body, but still recharge it enough to keep going? I don't know. Maybe you can have some insight on that. Like, what, what do you think would be an ideal 
short nap time in a 200 mile race that's going to take you over two days? It's going to take me two days. I'm, I mean, honestly, I don't know because I've never done that. When I, I've heard your nap times being like anywhere from like one to 20 minutes. Yeah. I'm sure I could fall asleep that fast. Like in ranger school, did you have to? It was like we would get, I would fall asleep uh, when we weren't supposed to sleep or we'd get less than an hour okay. and, and that would recharge me for yeah. a whole nother day. Yeah. But if I can get 30 minutes, I'm recharged, I'm ready to go. Sometimes that's all I need. But sometimes I would almost rather keep pushing through. Yeah. Because once I lay down, I close my eyes, my body almost, it like relaxes a little bit. And I want to keep pushing it as long as it can while it's still, everything's firing. Right. Right. That's where I want more people to try these 200 mile races um, just to get more information from like people's experiences. What's a good nap time? Because I have had a really killer one minute nap that was like, it felt like hours. I was really recharged after I didn't have to sleep again, but at a race later, the next year, I tried the one minute nap wasn't working. I tried two or three or four or five minute naps. None of them were hitting it out of the park like I wanted. So I think just more information, like as a group, what can we learn about the ideal nap time and when you take it or when you push through to keep on running? Do you tell your husband, as soon as my eyes close, start a timer and when one minute's up, wake me up? I uh, usually it's just like, I'm going to take this nap and, um, like they'll start the timer right away. So if I'm like still squirming around trying to get comfortable on my rock pillow that I made, that's just part of my time for napping. Is it one of those things too? Like, <laughs> you know, when you wake up, your alarm goes off early in the morning and you turn it off and you close your eyes for like 30 seconds, but your subconscious knows that you need to be up. So it wakes you up like a minute later. Is it the same for that? Where like you want to fall asleep and nap, but your your body knows it needs to wake up to finish this race? I think kind of. And also like I'm, I want to be racing, you know, like I'm trying to get to that finish line as fast as I can. So figuring out how to shut down all the systems so that it can relax for the one minute or two minutes is part of the game, I think. And then do you, do you hallucinate when you're, out there running on little sleep yeah every time well <laughs> if I'm lucky <laughs> uh so it happens in the dark usually for me if I've been out for um more than a day then it's pretty much guaranteed I'll hallucinate some things have you ever hallucinated during the day I have yeah that's that's real hallucination yeah I actually this summer at a race hallucinated um, during the day that this person was sitting with their back, they were sitting on the side of the trail, but their back was to the trail and they were playing a guitar. And as I was running up towards them, I was, I just was so baffled. Like, why wouldn't you face the trail and play your guitar for all of us? Like, why are you hogging it? <laughs> then they weren't even there. <laughs> Cause I think hallucinating at night I think that's pretty common. Mm -hmm. I'll hallucinate at night with like lack of sleep. Yeah. But I've never hallucinated during the day. Did you hallucinate at Leadville? Yeah. The last like 10 miles. Um, I did. The last 10 miles I was really having trouble to breathe too. I was wheezing and I couldn't get a deep breath. And Jordan, our creative director, his wife, Michaela, was pacing with me. And I was behind her and I kept seeing like things up ahead. And I thought they were checkpoints, yeah. like people sitting at checkpoints. I was like, why are there only two people at this checkpoint sitting down on chairs? And I get there and there was no one there. Were you saying it out loud or just in your head? In my head. Yeah. So I, I knew, I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not there, but I wonder if it's there. Yeah. And it was never there. Some people have like audio ones too, where they hallucinate hearing things or hearing people. Little lights will like trigger it sometimes too. Like at Leadville, they had the the chem lights mm -hmm. on the on the trail. It was a very well lit trail at night, but those would trigger it where I the, I thought the chem lights were certain things, 
And then, like we were talking about last night, um, on Leadville, it was like mile maybe, I want to say 70. What was that checkpoint called again? <laughs> I don't know. It's a secret. There's a, there's a secret. There's a secret <laughs> checkpoint out there. If you guys do Leadville. I didn't know if that was real or not. No one knows if it's real. It might have been. <laughs> I did a shot of uh, gummy bears there, and that's all I remember about that part. <laughs> I love it. So I'd love to talk about some other races. Um, Big's Backyard Ultra. The reason that one interests me so much is because it's the last man standing. Yeah. Race. 4.1 mile loop. Those, I've only recently found out about those. Um, I follow Jesse Eitzler. Yeah. And I saw he posted about one that's in Maine. Yep. I think it's in September. And as soon as he shared it, I went and signed up for it. I love it. And that's such a cool concept where it's like 4.1 miles. You have one hour to complete that loop. And then say you finish it in 45 minutes, you have 15 minutes to rest, and then you restart the next hour to do that loop again. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Big's Backyard, you went for 279 miles total? Yeah, two years ago it was two, yeah, 283 maybe. Okay. Are those ultras that you... Like, do you like those, those type where it's every hour on the hour? Yeah. Because the, like what's possible is totally unknown because four miles an hour is a pretty doable, sustainable pace. So it's really a mental game of the minutes between laps to convince yourself to go again and to maintain your body to keep on doing it. So I, I think it's so cool and it's such a, like, you're in your pain cave. You're really digging in one of those because you have so much time to think and it's so easy to stop. Like, it's not like you're in the middle of the mountains where there's, like, you have to keep moving to get to the next aid station. This is like, oh, four mile loop and then I could be done and be home comfortable and showered. Like, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why it's so interesting to me because you're you're really you're not just putting yourself in a pain cave, but you're fighting these mental like demons and limitations against yeah. yourself. Where how easy is it for someone where they hit mile one hundred and they know they can do that next four point one mile loop in an hour, but they take it a little bit slower to miss time. Yeah. Or choose not to go back out. Yeah. So that's one where you're you're actually choosing the hard right over the easier yeah. wrong. Yeah, 100%. And you're in that format for sure the community is like so strong in it because in a normal ultra like at Leadville, you were running by yourself in a ton of it because the field gets so spread out. In one of these, everyone starts the lap at the top of the hour so Every hour you're all together with the group and all of the crews are just camped out in this one area. So everyone just becomes like a teammate and a family reunion feel. And like people are sharing gear, people are, you know, helping each other out of chairs to come back for another lap. Like the community spirit in that type of race is huge. That's cool. Yeah. What's cool about ultras too that I realized is there's really no stereotype of of runner you have like 18 year olds to 70 plus year olds yeah male female skinny heavy like it you have like a, a field of and i know like when you get to the lead status it, it looks a lot different but when you have like general population of ultra runners you could pull all those people off the street and yeah. be like and you wouldn't know yeah and that's what's cool is it's like we were saying yesterday, the barrier to entry for running is just moving your feet. Mm-hmm. Now, how far do you want to take that is a different story. Yeah. Pretty cool at the ultras too, to talk to 
people in it to hear how they got into ultra running. Like what was your draw? Like what was the thing that made you sign up for that first one? And how did you then end up here at this backyard race or at this hundred mile race? It's fascinating to hear people's stories with it. Do you think you went after ultras or ultras came after you (laughs) in a sense of like, say for example, we'll put it in terms of baseball. This little kid grows up and he's like, one day I'm going to be a professional baseball player. One day I'm going to be a professional baseball player and does everything he has to do to become that professional baseball player. And then there's the other athlete who just loves the sport and kind of just falls into professional sports because he's so passionate about it. Which one were you? Uh, maybe more of the second. I'm not sure. I didn't know ultra running was a thing and – Probably when I was a kid, I didn't know like being a professional athlete was a real dream that you could have. Um, So, yeah, probably more of the second. Okay. Did you, when you were a kid, think you'd be a professional athlete? I mean, I wanted to be, when I was younger, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. And then I started playing baseball, thought I was decent. And then my younger brother, Preston, started playing sports. I'm from a small town in Pennsylvania called Palmyra. And as soon as he started playing sports, he was a stud. Football, baseball. He was in the local newspaper. (laughs) He was like getting offers for college to play D1 baseball, football. So I kind of just stopped. I was like, "Mm, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step to the side and I'm going to join the army. So you didn't play then? Towards the end of high school? No. I I stopped really playing sports. I just focused on getting in shape for the military. I was like, I was decent at sports, but I was never, I wasn't like a stud. Okay. Right. Like I wasn't starting on anything. And then I found like fitness, general fitness being going to the gym and running. And for me, it's like, I, I get so much more out of it when I'm, trying to push these these limits of like I'm I'm personally always competing with myself. I want to see how far I can push it. Mm-hmm. I don't really care about beating the person to the left and right of me. And for me that's what fitness is. It's how far what are my limits? I want to yeah. know what my limits are. And and that's kind of my approach now. Yeah. That's cool. So for Big's backyard ultra is it the same uh, organizer as Barkley Marathon? It is, yeah. I didn't know that until recently. Mm-hmm. Laz? His name's Laz. Uh, and he has a ton of great races. All of them, these like evil but wonderful plans to help people see what their limits are. So the backyard concept is perfect for anyone, even if you're not going to stay in it to try and win it. You could surprise yourself with how many miles you can run when it's four at a time. Like it's a very bite-sized chunk at a time. Same with like the Barkley Marathons. He was like, let's have people test themselves out here in these woods with, you know, a compass and these books they have to find and help them see what they're capable of. Or he has uh, a race across Tennessee, like it's Vol State So all the way across the state of Tennessee where you just like get your aid stations from gas stations. Like you're just fueling yourself along the way. Um, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it's, he has a ton of crazy concepts or there's one called a race for the ages where depending on your age, you get that many hours to run and then it's a straight winner. So like someone who's 80 has 80 hours to accumulate miles and then they're racing against someone who's 24 who has 24 hours. I love these concepts. Yeah. Because when you look at like marathons, you really, you know what you're getting into. All right, I'm going to go run 26.2 miles. This time I'm going to run it in San Francisco or this time I'm going to run it in Germany. Right. Or like, you know what you're doing. It's, you're, do, you're running the same distance. Yeah. I love these different concepts of ultras where, it's still like ultra, but there's really no definition to that. Yeah. Like, like these organizers can make it what they want it to be. And 
I came across the Barkley Marathon a few years ago. I watched Gary Robbins' documentary, Where Dreams Go to Die. Highly recommend. Oh my gosh. I've watched that so many times. Yeah. Last time I watched it, actually, we were, me and my wife were on our honeymoon in Cabo. And I was prepping for uh, Iron Man Texas at the time. And when I'm going to prep for something, I'm like, I got to get my run in. I got to get my run in. So there was really nowhere to run in Cabo. So I went down to the hotel gym, hopped on the treadmill for like 15 miles. And I was watching Where Dreams Go to Die. And, yes. then, I, and then I watched a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of documentaries on Western States 100. Mm -hmm. And those docs are really good. Yeah. Ultra docs get me emotional. There's some really good filmmakers in the space who are capturing cool stuff. Yeah, they, they get me in the feels. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd love to kind of talk about Barkley a little bit. I know Barkley is kind of that thing as well where it's, it's part of it's secretive and there's things you can't talk about. But traditionally, I, it's five loops. It's five loops to complete it. I think in its history, only like, I don't know, 16 people have ever completed the Barkley Marathons. But it's an unmarked course. It's mostly off trail. And you're out in these woods of Frozen Head State Park, which is um, very hilly. Like, it's a very hilly state park. And you're trying to find these books that Laz has placed out there to prove that you did the loop. So when you get to a book, you have a bib number on and you rip out that number that correlates with your bib so that by the end of the loop, you have all however many books and you can prove that you went to all of them and did the course. And then if you can do that, you get to go out for another lap. But you're just navigating with a paper map and a compass and the weather in that state park is like uh, always, I think, just terrible. It's foggy. It's rainy. Like these weather systems just like sit on the peaks in that area, I think, and just like wreak havoc. <laughs> and, you, and you finished two laps? I finished two unofficially. My second lap was too slow to count for an official two lap. And do you want to do it again? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It made me like, it was so fun. We were just sliding around in the mud out there. It was awful weather, but it was, it just felt like such an adventure and like time stopped. I had no concept of time. It was either daytime or it was nighttime where I needed a headlamp. And that was my only gauge on like time passing. Um, yeah. So I would for sure like to go test myself again. Did they allow you to wear watches that year? Nope. No watches you get, everyone gets issued a, the watch you're allowed to use. So in the past, he's done like just an old school, like Timex or Cas Casio. Casio. Yeah. Or it just tells you the time. And this past year he issued us these like pocket watches. So it was this big metal chain and pocket watch where you, you could click it open and see roughly the time, but it, it doesn't even matter. Like mile splits out there. No one cares. You're just like getting from one book to the next and trying to make it back in time to go again. And it, was it the the train that got you or was it the land navigation that it got was, you the most? Yeah, it was kind of a combo of the land navigation and the weather. So fo it, fog rolled in and it was raining and really cold. And so we just started making some poor navigation choices. Or not making choices. <laughs> like, <laughs> Do they give you a map before you go out and then you have to follow that map to the books? Yeah. There's a map involved. <laughs> it, this sounds mysterious and it makes me want to do it even more. You would love it. Yeah, it's it, crazy. It, it sounds so cool. It's a cool adventure. And uh, like, I don't know, the fact that barely anyone finishes it, I think is makes it really intriguing. Because then... You know, what's it take to get out on lap three or four? Or if you're in lap five, like how far into your pain cave are you? I would love to experience that. Well, I remember watching the documentary and it was, it was like Gary or it was, it was, I forget the gentleman's name, but he was really in the pain cave and he was like, he was right on pace with Gary yeah. for a lot of it. I think it was Jared. It was Jared. Yeah. yeah. Jared Campbell. Yep, that's it. Jared Campbell. 
He's finished it multiple times. He has. Yeah. I remember seeing him and I was thinking that man, like something changed that man when he was out there. Yeah. That that was an evolutionary yeah. transition in life. <laughs> but no, that, that one seems super cool. So what I'd love to like hear more about is when you're racing these ultras, I'd assume that it starts out mostly as physical, but at some point in that race, physical dies off and then it transition, transitions to all mental. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Do you, do you know when it's like, click, okay, now the body's done, the mind is here. What is that experience? I think um, it toggles back and forth for me the entire race. So some races... You start out and your body is fine. You're at very low miles, very few hours of running in general. So you're feeling really good still. And then slowly it like creeps where your mind is pulling a lot more of the weight than your body is doing at that time. And then it'll switch back where you're feeling really good. You're like, you're running on clouds again. Um, and then sometimes it'll just sink into there is no more physical left. Now it's just a mental battle. And I try to just toggle as smoothly between those as possible and like take the course and the day as it comes. And so not to panic, like if you're switching to your mental really early on to not, you know, judge the next hundred miles based on mile two, like just stay in the moment, stay present and take whatever's thrown at you as best you can. Do you think after every one of these races, you grow and evolve a little bit? I hope so. I mean, yeah. Is that the goal? Yeah, it's absolutely the goal. Yeah, that's, for me, that's why I want to choose harder things. I want to I chase these bigger obstacles in life because it's like, what, what is my capacity? Yeah. What are my capabilities? And you don't know what's untapped until you try to tap into it. Right. Like you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. It took me a long time to realize that where a lot of people live their entire life with this untapped potential and they don't know how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think, I mean, ultras are a great example of what you can try to try and like tap into that new thing, but it doesn't have to be running. I think you can do it in anything just to like try and be a little more uncomfortable um, because that's when you get to see, like, could you go even farther with it or where are you at with it? I mean, like our, our slogan here at BPN is go one more. And the more I learn about ultras and the ultra community and the people that are in the ultra community, I think there's very rarely a time when someone signs up for one ultra and says, nope, not for me. But it, it seems like time and time again, if, if, if you have the ambition the courage and the commitment to sign up for an ultra that probably says something about your personality and, and who yeah. you are. And you're probably <laughs> going to sign up for something bigger and larger after that. Like, I think you're a prime example of, okay, how, I mean, let's go after this 500 mile Colorado <laughs> trail. Let's, I mean, I won't, I won't be surprised if you're like, yeah, I'm going for a thousand mile race next. Yeah. I would love to for sure. I got to try 500 again because I didn't make it. And I think that distance is pretty intriguing and what a fun way to spend a week. <laughs> I mean, it's like a, it's like a <laughs> mind blowing 500 miles. Yeah. <laughs> 500 miles, man. Well, I think so many people like search for these opportunities to be quote unquote harder or tougher and people will go to massive extents to try to become, to find like this part of themselves or see what their capabilities are. But it's almost like, here it is. Like it's on this platter, sign up for this ultra. And yeah. I think for most people, even if you're not a runner, you're going to learn a lot about yourself from an ultra marathon. Yeah, for sure. If, um, like if people are curious, just getting out to crew someone or spectate at an aid station or volunteer somewhere out on course, like it's 
really cool. And I think that can get you hooked real quick. <laughs> oh yeah. Is, is your, is your husband always crewing every race you do? We try to like, since I, um, stopped teaching and went all in on this, we decided like, this is also a perfect opportunity to then travel to these races together and make this a thing that we share. And I'm really lucky that he loves crewing because then we get to make all of these memories together doing something we both enjoy. Um, and yeah, to laugh about them afterwards or, you know, just share all of those moments because I like, that's what we have at the end, you know, is all of these memories we create, all of these moments we share with people in our lives when we sit on our rocking chairs when we're 90, like that's what I want is heaps of those and uh, to enjoy it as much as possible. Yeah. I, uh, I, know, I know there's this quote by Matthew McConaughey and it says less impressed, more involved. And ever since I heard that, it's really stuck with me where sometimes it's really easy to live a life that is, I mean, look at social media. A lot of things on social media are there to impress mm -hmm. other people. And if you stop focusing on that and focus on being more involved, it not only brings more fulfillment to yourself personally, but it, it expands to all the people around you. Yeah. I think it's a powerful one. Yeah. That's cool. Um, but yeah, so Kevin does come to crew me and he'll pace me sometimes too during the races and I have some friends and like my parents have been to races just like how your movie depicted it and your crew being all in on this goal of yours. Like that's, I think one of the most fun parts of ultra running is having your team and feeling like it's this group goal that you're trying to get. Well, that's why we went with the campaign name more than the miles. Yeah. When we were trying to think of, because we knew the intent of what we wanted to do with that film. We wanted to show how the entire team was involved in this process. And it was just my job to just move my body. Right. On the trail. You had the easiest job. That's, I did have the easiest yeah. job. Yeah. I had nothing else to worry about except just putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And then uh, Tyler came up with the name more than the miles. And for me, that just, that said everything. Yeah. Because if someone like looks at, at your career and says, oh yeah, she ran hundred miles here, 240 miles here, 500 miles here. Like that distance doesn't give it justice to what was actually experienced. Like the, the, the transformation yeah. internally, the relationships that were built, yeah, like the depth to what was done during those miles. And uh, when I was younger, I didn't understand that about running. Running was just running. Mm -hmm. But now I understand, and I'm, I'd say I'm starting to understand the depth to what it can do. And it's, it's, it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm so psyched that you want to do more ultras. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be reaching out to you soon about, uh, the Barkley and the lab. <laughs> yes. Well, Courtney, I, uh, I greatly appreciate the time. Thanks for making the trip into Texas. Thank you. Top on the podcast really means a lot. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>